Now, he too should have arrived on horseback and we'd even arrange for a specially large horse for him because he won't run me saying this, he weighs 18 stone. And uh, this is the point, you see. People think John of Gaunt means that he got this name because he was rather a skinny sort of person. Not at all. It's simply because it was actually in 1340 uh, he was born to Queen Philippa in the town of Gaunt, or Ghent as we call it, in Belgium. So he's really John of Gaunt. See, John of Gaunt. And here he comes. Give him a welcome. Good people, I thank you for your welcome. As I humbly take over from my late mother, Her Majesty Queen Philippa, the administration of this castle, honour and royal forest, Before God, I swear to you that the House of Lancaster will keep faith with the town of Knaresborough from this year of our Lord, 1372, until the unseen future. For I love this place for itself, but also because it is an ancient and honourable part of this beloved land of ours. This royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, This earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. That speech, of course, was put into the mouth of John of Gaunt by Shakespeare in his great tragedy, Richard II. This tells the story of how John of Gaunt died in 1399, and when he died, Richard II seized his estates. So John's son, Henry Bolingbroke, the new Duke of Lancaster, worked to avenge his father and restore his rights. And in the end, he deposed King Richard and ruled in his stead as Henry IV. Now, one of the places where Bolingbroke placed Richard under house arrest was here in Knaresborough Castle, shortly before his mysterious death, probably by murder, in Pontefract Castle. Many prisoners have languished in the terrible dungeon beneath us, but Knaresborough's most distinguished prisoner was kept in this portion of the castle which serves as our stage, what we call the King's Chamber. Here he comes, Richard II, as Shakespeare imagined him, attempting to face up to the fact that he, the rightful King of England, is a prisoner in one of his own castles. Not all the water in the rough rude sea can wash the balm from an anointed king. The breath of worldly men cannot depose the deputy elected by the Lord. For every man that Bolingbroke hath pressed to lift shrewd steel against our golden crown, God, for his Richard, hath in heavenly pay a glorious angel. Then, if angels fight, weak men must fall for heaven still guards the right. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court. Cover your heads 
and mock not flesh and blood with formal reverence. Throw away your respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty, for you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you, feel want, taste grief, need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me, I am a king? a lot of royalty, haven't we? The kings and queens, and more to but than that. And we have emphasised the royal associations, and rightly so, but we must not overlook the ordinary folk of the town. Those many Nersborough men, for example, killed during the Wars of the Roses at the bloody Battle of Towton in 1461. Or, in times of peace, the townsfolk met by the antiquary of Henry VIII, John Leyland, who visited Nersborough in about 1538. And he made notes of everything, and he noted, very impressed, he said, by the liveliness of the market and the strength of the castle, and by the remarkable water of the dropping well, which had the power to turn all things to stone. Yet, significantly, Leyland made no mention of our most famous Tudor figure, Mother Shipton. And the reason is that at that time, certainly, she was living in York, as I think she will now be able to confirm. Hi, lad. I heard what you were saying. I did live in York, in during houses. I was married to Toby Shipton, you know. He was a carpenter out at Minster. Can you tell us, Mother Shipton, what it was that let you becoming a household name as a prophetess? Aye, it was that visit by Cardinal Wolsey. 1530, it was. Wolsey were in disgrace with King Henry. So he thought he'd come up to uh, York for the very first time, mind, and get us to make a fuss about him being our Archbishop. But I told everybody, I said, where was he might see York, but he'll never get into the city. Well, now, this is true. This is history. Cardinal Woolsey got as far as Cable Castle, stood on top of a tower, looking over in distance at York Minster. When I get to York, he says, I'll have young woman, meaning me, burns as a witch. Aye, those were his very words. But you know, sir, the minute he said this, an officer came, clapped his hand on his shoulder and arrested him on a charge of high treason. So, you see, I was right after all. Who's this so, York? But he never got there. Well, the Shepton was certainly right. There's no doubt that Wolsey was arrested at Kaywood taken south to face trial before the king, but he died on the journey and was buried in Leicester Abbey. That's what made her name. I wonder if you could give us a few more examples of the prophecies you made in York, Mother Shipton. Aye. There came a, a woman with one eye, and she trod in many men's blood up to the knee. There were three knights in Petergate in York, a boy born in pomfret with three thumbs, and those three knights gave him the, the three horses to hold while they won England. And uh, all but... Noble blood. All but, no, but one noble blood were gone. They shall rule the time. And they will rule the time that ever they were born to see so much bloodshed. 
Those actual lines from that 1641 pamphlet and some interesting lines are about the siege of York and the great devastation of London. But in 1667, a booklet was published claiming that Mother Shipton had been born in Knaresborough near the dropping well, in a house actually, it says, near the dropping well. A daughter of the devil with supernatural powers. And it was this rather fanciful booklet, very fanciful booklet, which started the unfortunate fashion of inventing Mother Shipton's prophecies about events which had already taken place, which of course is an infallible way of getting them right. And this was carried a stage further in Victorian times when a Brighton bookseller called Charles Hindley confessed that he had simply made up some of the best-known prophecies and put them into the mouth of poor Mother, Sh Mother Shipton. For example, modern transport. Carriages without horses shall go, and accidents fill the world with woe. And in this next one, Charles Handley was thinking about wireless telegraphy, but how neatly it applies to the internet. Around the world, thoughts shall fly in the twinkling of an eye. And most alarming and most frequently quoted of all, then the world to an end shall come in... What date is it now? 2000. In the year 2001! <laughs> Well, Mother Shipton is just a harmless figure of folklore, adding colour to the Knaresborough scene. But if you want something really sinister, how about this fellow? Excuse me, sir, I wonder if you'd mind answering a few questions. I have nothing to say, and I am in great haste. I have urgent business to attend to. Your name, I believe, is Guy Fawkes. Aye, and an honourable name it is in the city of York. I was born there in the year of our Lord, 1570, and baptised at St Michael the Belfry, close by the Minster where my father worked as a lawyer. So you were brought up a Protestant then? I educated in St. Peter's School. But then, after my father died, my mother married a Catholic, and I rediscovered the old faith. May I ask what you're doing here in Nursborough, Mr. Fawkes? My mother married Dennis Bainbridge, a good Catholic, who has property in the village of Scotton, close by. I came to live there with my mother and two sisters when I was about 18. Soon I became intrigued by the secret comings and goings of the priests, trying to keep alive a religion which had been most unjustly outlawed. And that is why I volunteered to join the Spanish army, fighting in the Netherlands. You rose to rank of captain, I believe. True. And fought with distinction at the Siege of Calais. I am no rough villain, sir, but I'm proud to sign my name, Guy Fawkes of Scotton, gentleman. Not the mark of a gentleman, though, to attempt to blow up the king and his parliament. Sir, I was chosen for this work because of the expertise gained in the Spanish army. I have now accumulated 36 barrels of gunpowder and carefully positioned them in the vaults of the House of Lords, ready for the 5th of November, 1605. I consider it my duty to rid this land of the Scottish James I and all his pernicious Protestant influence. To attempt to destroy the king is a desperate remedy. Sir, desperate diseases require desperate remedies. <laughs> Remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. Well, as everybody knows, our local terrorist was caught red-handed and famously failed to, joy, to destroy James I. What many people do not know is that the failure of Guy Fawkes was driven home in Knaresborough when King James authorised a school to be founded in his name, here in the very district where Guy Fawkes had lived. 
This probably explains the readiness with which the king granted letters patent to the Reverend Dr. Robert Challoner to found the Free Grammar School of King James near the parish church on the 26th of October, 1616. We still have the original charter with a colour portrait of King James and the original school rules, the laws and ordinances. Here are some samples read by boys from the old school. No girls, alas, until well into the 19th century. The schoolmaster shall be a godly, learned and sober man, a diligent teacher and observer of these ordinances. If not, he shall be removed the better saw for and put in his place. The maester shall see that all his scholars repair into the school by six o'clock in the morning in summer and by seven in the winter. They remain until eleven o'clock of the forenoon and in the afternoon from one till six. The first thing to be done after assembly in the morning and the last thing in the evening shall be, upon their knees, with due reverence, to use the forms of prayer set down by the founder. They shall sing a psalm, such as Psalm 119, with its 176 verses. The maester shall have diligent regards to the manners of his scholars and see that they come not to school uncombed, unwashed, ragged or slovenly. But before all things, he shall severely punish swearing, lying, pitching of pockets, stealing, fighting, wanton speech, unclean behaviour and such like. The schoolmaster shall carefully teach his scholars to pronounce distinctly and diligently and to observe the point, comma, colon and semicolon and in writing Latin rightly to use the words, tenses, prepositions and adverbs. None above the first form shall speak English in the school or at play but all conversation shall be in Latin. Amor, amas, amat, Amamus, amatis, amant. Iram, iras, irat, iramus, iratis, irant. Cicero, Ovid, Virgil, Seneca. Oh, oh what fun! Quick, quick, quick. One, two, three. Quid, retribuum, domino. Pro omnibus, quae, retribuit me. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? The writ didn't write about screaming at the top of the voices in those days, did they? Very well behaved lads indeed. Sorry about the girls, but there weren't any there till into the 19th century. Now, uh, some of you may have recognised that as uh, the school motto, actually, the Latin, from Psalm 116. Now, another decision made in 1616 was that James I granted the lordship of Knaresborough to his son, Prince Charles, who was then only 16. 